Hello, welcome to Wagner Academy as we begin our journey through chapter two, the reasoning and proof chapter. This lesson deals with inductive reasoning and conjecture. These are a few terms you should know by the time we're done with this lesson. And make sure you use those extra examples in your book, as always, to help you with your assignment if you're one of my students. So let's get started. This first blank should say a conjecture. So let's decide what a conjecture means what that is. That is an educated guess. So you may have called that a hypothesis in oh, a science class, something like that. Can you hear that airplane in the background? Boy, there's, there's a, a plane flying in the background here. But a conjecture is an educated guess based on known information. So Sherlock Holmes, he makes a lot of conjectures. He makes a lot of educated guesses based on information. I might refer to Sherlock Holmes throughout this chapter. We'll see. And this set of blanks for the second one should say inductive reasoning. So now we'll know what the title of the chapter, or title of the lesson I should say, is all about. So inductive reasoning uses a number of specific examples to arrive at a plausible generalization or prediction. So again, Sherlock doing inductive reasoning a lot. He'll, he'll gather all these clues and he'll arrive at a plausible generalization or prediction based on that. That's called inductive reasoning. So let's do some inductive reasoning down here in example one. Make a conjecture about the next item in each sequence. So it looks like we have one and then we have, if I count these up I see four, but the, the picture is expanding out. So it looks like I'm basically taking what I had here, copying the dot and adding adding a, a row to it over here. So this is going to be three high, this is two high, this is one high, this one should be four high. So I should have one, two, three, and four, and then I'm going to have triangles coming off to the side like that. So one, two, three. It's getting one lower every time. One, two, and one. And so your picture would look like that. Now there's some other things you might look at that and observe. Uh, you might observe, for instance, I'm going to use a different color here. This isn't something you have to write out. But these were other things that I noticed. I noticed that this one was equal to one dot. This one had four dots. This one had nine dots. And this one has 16 dots. So there's a pattern going on here. This one looks like I'm adding three each time. So this is another conjecture you could have made. You add three, then you add five, then you add seven. So you start with three, adding three, and then you add two more than the previous time to get to the next term in the sequence. You could also notice that this is one squared, this is two squared, this is three squared, and this is four squared. So some other things I noticed that I could conjecture about this pattern, I would conjecture then I would guess that the next one would be 25, it would be 5 squared, and if you drew it out, it in fact would be. We're not going to do that because it just says the next item in the sequence. Down here I see a pattern of numbers instead of pictures, but it looks like we're multiplying by 3, but not just 3, but negative 3, because the sign is changing every time. So what is 81, positive 81 times negative 3? The next term in the sequence would be that number, negative 243. And so if you had to describe the pattern and say, hey, this is what's going on, the pattern is that you're multiplying by negative 3. So multiply the previous term by negative 3. Moving on to example 2. A very famous conjecture, Goldbach's conjecture, states that every in even integer greater than 2 can be written as the sum of two prime numbers. Show this conjecture is true for the first 10 prime numbers greater than 2. And I see a mistake in my... Oops. This should say not first 10 prime numbers, but the first 10 even numbers. There we go. So the first 10 even numbers greater than 2. I have 4 would be the first even number greater than 2, and I'm doing this for the first 10 even numbers greater than 2. So 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and you might be saying, Mr. Wagner, this seems like 
a lot. Are we going to have enough time to even do this? Hold your horses. Hold the phone, you'll be fine. This will be easy, watch. So yes, there are 10 things to think about here, but think of some prime numbers that add to 4. 2 is a prime number because only 1 times 2 equals 2. There's no other factors of 2. So 2 plus 2 would work. For 6, it doesn't look like I can use 2 in this one because 2 plus 4, 4 would not be a prime number. However, 3 and 3 are both prime numbers, so I could add 3 and 3. So I've showed it to be true for the first two cases. Have I showed it to be true for all 10 yet? No, it doesn't mean that it's going to work for all 10, but let's see. We've got 3 plus 5, that would work for 8. Oh, 5 plus 5 would work for 10. You could also do 3 plus 7, that one would work there as well. 3 plus 9, nope, 9's not prime. How about 5 plus 7? Yep, those are both prime. And then 14, that could be written as 7 plus 7. 16, notice I can't use any even numbers anymore after 4 because then the other number would have to be even and that other number would have 2 as a factor. So I couldn't do 8 and 8, I couldn't do 10 and 6, I couldn't do 2 and 14. I could do here 3 and 13. 5 and 11 also would have worked. You might be able to think of another one that works. I don't think there is another one though. Uh, 18, 3 and 15, 15 is not prime. How about 5 and 13? That'll work. 13 is prime, 5 is prime. 20, we got 7 and 13. That's the first one that came to mind for me. And for 22, 5 and 17, that's the first one that came to mind for me for that one. There may be others. Uh, have we proven gold box conjecture? Just because we showed that the first 10 cases were true. Definitely not. So make a note of this. This is a very important note as we continue our way through this chapter and through geometry and through math in general. We have not proven this is true. in all cases. Just because we proved the first 10 were true doesn't mean it's true in all cases. How many cases are there? Well, there's an infinite number of cases because there's an infinite number of even integers greater than two. How many have they actually proven? This is just for an interesting side note. They've actually shown every, at least at the point of making this video, that every even integer greater than two up to this number right here which is actually, don't write this out unless you're really interested in this, but it's a 4 with 13 zeros, not 13, 18, excuse me, 18 zeros after it. So that's 9. Dun, dun, dun. I, did I get them all? Yes, I got, got this. So this would be thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions. This is actually 4 quintillion. So they've proven this is true up to the four, up to four quintillion. They've shown all those even numbers can be written as a sum of two primes. Does that prove that it's true? No, because this goes on forever. This is just a tiny sliver of infinity. And that's a, that's a discussion I'm not gonna get into right now. Is it even actually a tiny sliver of infinity? No, like, whoa, blow in your mind here. Infinity goes on forever. This, this is nothing compared to infinity. This is zero compared to infinity, crazy. Uh, but just because you prove it's true for a, a bunch of different cases, cases doesn't mean it's actually true in all cases. You have to prove it in general, which is something that we'll do uh, a little bit in this, this chapter and in this course. So make a conjecture, number three, make a conjecture about the following coordinates using the graph below to illustrate your conjecture. Is this a trap? I don't know, we've got, oh, Mission Impossible mouse over here. Four, negative, or negative four, three, that's where T is at. Negative four, three, here's T. We are plotting the points. If I don't plot the points, it's gonna be hard to make a conjecture about these points. So let's do that first. We've got four, three, that's gonna be over here. Four, right four, up three. And then A is at negative six, negative four, so over to the left six, down four. This is A. 
And then finally, P is at 6, 4. So we go right 6 and down 4. So we're making a conjecture. We're making an observation, educated guess based on our observation. What do we think about these points? Well, let's connect these points and see what we get. So connect them. Use, use a straight edge if you got one. Ruler edge. I used to use my calculator, the edge of my calculator, to make straight lines, or the edge of my ID to make straight lines. Back when I was in high school, it worked out pretty well. If I was in a bind, if I needed needed a quick straight edge, uh, so I have that right there. What kind of shape does that look like to you? Have you heard of trapezoids before? That's oh, yeah, I see. Okay, this wasn't a trap; it was a hint. So a trapezoid. I would say this is parallel to that and I would say even more beyond that I would say this and this are congruent it looks like those are going to be the same size and so have I proven that this is congruent to this not not exactly I haven't used the Pythagorean theorem or distance formula do I have to do that here no because I'm just making a conjecture I'm just making an educated guess based on what I observe based on what I see so my conjecture is that Yikes. My conjecture is that this trap, to name polygons, we just name the letters in order, in an order that they come in. So this, I couldn't actually say trap. That's a good point to make here. I could say, because I have to go in, I have to start at one point and then go in order around the shape somehow. So I could say T-R-P-A. I could say that works. So T-R-P-A you connect those dots in that order, they draw the shape out. T-R-A-P would make kind of a Z shape right there. That would not draw the shape out. So T-R-P-A would work. A good little side point to make there, I feel like. So T-R-P-A is, and we conjecture it's an isosceles trapezoid. And again, we haven't proven that's true. I'd have to, to demonstrate that these two slopes are the same, which I think would be pretty easy. They're both horizontal lines, so they have the same slope. And I'd have to demonstrate that if you form right triangles, use the Pythagorean theorem, or if you use distance formula on these two points and these two points, show that those are both congruent to each other. All right, example four, final example. After writing out one more thing here, a counterexample exactly what it sounds like it's counter to an example it's a false example so a counterexample is a false example that shows that a conjecture is not true so example four provide a counterexample to the following conjecture so we're going to try to refute the, the educated guess the hypothesis uh, so if x and y are real numbers where x is greater than zero and y is greater than zero, then x times y is greater than one. So let's think of some examples first of all. I think examples are easier typically to, to come up with than counter examples. So some examples that would actually work. So the first part has to be true. X and y are real numbers that are greater than zero. So let's say, oh, I'll pick a couple of easy numbers. So let's say I pick x is 2 and y is 3. Then what's xy? xy is 2 times 3. If we write them next to each other, that means multiply those two. So that would be 6. So the first part was true, and the second part was also true. That's a, an example. When you have the first part true and the second part, also true. So this works. Bummer. I didn't find a counterexample yet. Let's try, oh, still have to be bigger than zero. Let's try some bigger numbers. Let's go with 10 and 18. Maybe going, going big will help. Let's see. What's x times y? Uh, definitely not. 180. Is that greater than 1? Still greater than 1? Yep, you bet. So that didn't seem like that helped. Maybe I'll try going... Oh, a little, a little smaller with my x value. So it says x and y are real numbers. That doesn't mean they have to be whole numbers. It just means they have to be real numbers. So 
we've got, I could use a decimal. I'm going to go with 1.2. And I'll go with another decimal. I'll go with 3.5 for y. If you multiply those together, you would get 4.2. Hmm, interesting. So I'm getting smaller and using decimals, or using, I could think of these as fractions as well. This is 1 and 1 fifth, 3 and 1 half. So it seems like I'm getting on the right track here. Let's come up now with a counter example. So I want to make a point before I write that down. So this right here, we're going to learn this later in this chapter more thoroughly, but this part right here is actually called the hypothesis. So this is the part you're assuming to be true. So hypothesis, in the case of, of geometry, in the case of logic math, it's, it's referring to the part after the if. So this part... To have an example or a counterexample, the hypothesis has to be true. So this is the hypothesis. And again, we'll define this more thoroughly, more technically, more precisely later on in this chapter. But this is called the conclusion, the part after the then. So the conclusion is false. This is in a counterexample. That's why I'm putting that over here. So uh, the examples, the hypothesis was true, and the conclusion was also true. But with a counterexample, you're going to have the hypothesis, the part after the if, being true, but then the conclusion being false. So a counterexample, uh, why don't I do that? I'll put little bullet points over here. These are all three different examples. This would be a counterexample. If x, I never said that x had to be greater than 1, I just said it had to be greater than 0. Same thing with y. So I could have a decimal or a fraction that was in between 0 and 1. So I could have x is 0 0.5 and I could have y, oh, I'll go with 0 0.3. Then you multiply those two together, you have 0.15. 0.15 not greater than 1. However, the first part was true. X was greater than 0 and Y was also greater than 0. So this is the part where the where this is an, a counterexample because the first part's true and the second part is false. So with counterexamples, this has to be the case. Hypothesis is true, conclusion is false. It looks like we have a valid answer. You could have picked any values for X and Y that were less than 1 but greater than 0. You could also have even picked a value for x that was between 0 and 1 and then pick a y value small enough, not necessarily less than 1, but small enough so that when you multiply them together, you would get a number less than 1. So, refuted, I would say I refute your, sorry Mr. Dog there, I would say I refute your conjecture instead. So let's say it like that. I refute your conjecture. The hypothesis for, the, for our case is going to be this part after the if. The conjecture is that educated guess that we make. That'll do it for this lesson. Oh, gold box conjecture, something I forgot to, to mention. There's actually these seven famously unsolvable, supposedly, math problems worth a million dollars called the Millennium Problems. In 2010, when somebody actually solved one of them, um, they were offered a million dollars for it. They decided they didn't want the million dollars. So that's pretty crazy. Um, but there's still six more problems out there. This is not one of those problems. Gold box conjecture is not one of those million dollar problems, six remaining. Um, but it is a very hard to solve problem. Nobody's come up with a, a proof that it's actually true yet. Uh, so with, with these terms, make sure you know these terms. Have a great day, as always. And I'll see you for Lesson 2.2.